are we going to appall you with something confidential and disgusting? Let's hope so, because that is what you really like. Unconfessed crimes of buried wickedness. If that is what brings you to us, the prospect of hearing horrors, you shall not go unrewarded. I don't believe it. The whole city is talking. You hear it all over. What a story. What a scandal. What a comedy. What a tragedy. Incredible. I don't believe it. Who can believe it? What horrors have you heard? Tell us. Tell us. Tell us at once. Yo, what is up with it, listeners? Welcome to a sort of a super special bonus new side project thing for Carousel Sniper Victim. There's going to be some uh, interviews, throw them out every once in a while, whenever we can. I was lucky enough to sit down with Hugh Brown, who's a documentary film photographer. He's travelled around the world and done a bunch of crazy, insane shit. He's like real life James Bond, Crocodile Dundee, Adventure Man, but above all just hell nice genuine bloke and agreed to sit down and tell me some of his crazy adventures. He's been on the ABC and been featured in a bunch of shit and crazy photographs. He's got a few uh, projects in the works at the moment, one called Cruelest Earth, which is all about artisanal mining all around the world and he visited an area, uh, a mountain called Cerro Rico, where it's claimed so many lives. It's just fucking crazy shit. So show Hugh Brown some love. Go check out his work. Go to uh, cruelestearth.com and check out that project. And I hope you guys enjoy listening as much as I enjoyed producing it. All right. Later, y'all. interrupt our program to bring you this important message. You're listening to Carousel Sniper Victim, a dead glass design production with your host, Sean Jeffrey. <laughs> All right, Hugh, thanks for joining us, mate. It's really appreciated. You started the journey several years ago now to document i guess the most dangerous and remote mining around the world done by women children and usually with their bare hands you seem very driven and a lot of the places you go to are remote and dangerous and pretty spectacular what drives you to want to do what you do yeah absolutely um when when you talk about that sort of being driven, I I can't explain it. You know, I searched. You know, I pushed really hard for the first twenty eight years of my life, trying to work out what it was I wanted to do. And I tried different things. I studied law. I studied business. I was a a management consultant, and none of it really gave me any satisfaction. And around about um, two thousand ten, I decided to um, work on this project, which I've termed term the cruelest earth and and i can't explain why i'm so driven um i mean the the bottom line is i'll either finish the project or i'll die trying to finish the project um and i think a lot of that comes from when i say i can't explain why i'm so driven i think a lot of that comes from the fact that you know i've spent a lot of time in the pilbara the pilbara is said to have the earliest known evidence of life on earth which began um, back around 3.6 billion years old, 3.6 billion years ago, and uh, the stromatolites in the Pilbara, the oldest known stromatolites, are 3.49 billion years old. So, if you put the beginning of life on Earth into a one-hour movie, human beings came along in the last half second of that movie, so we're nothing. So, when you realise that all the rubbish we carry on with, um, we, you know, this concept that life is sacrosanct and all of that, I, I don't necessarily buy that. My my view is that um, all you can do is is that which feels important. Yeah, man, that's 
It's so true. One of my idols is Carl Sagan, the old planetary scientist, and he had that. He tried to popularize that same sort of opinion many years ago with like a calendar, sort of just a yearly calendar. And he was like, you know, you put the Big Bang at midnight a.m. January first. We've come along in the last two seconds to midnight on December thirty first. Like our story is nothing in comparison. I remember, like, so you, so you, so you were in management. You were saying, like, back in the day, and then you came over to the Pilbara and started. Did you start doing photography out there first? No, look, I was a management consultant, and um, we were doing strategy consulting for some some of the largest companies in the world. Yeah, and we had a meeting in Perth, and I decided to sort of take leave after that meeting, and and I travelled up the WA coast. I actually hitchhiked, just something different. And I got to Broome and then the bungles and I decided that, you know, if I couldn't hitch a lift into the bungles, I'd walk in the 53 kilometers from the turn off. But I got a lift in and and to cut a long story short, I decided to move up to Broome. I returned back to my job. I flew back to Broome, got a job and then turfed my, my job back in Melbourne. And up until that point, I'd probably taken, you know, 20 rolls of film in my life and photography was never on the was never on the radar. It just sort of happened a few years later. Huh. So what I think was it 2006 or so? Was it your first, when did you go to Africa? That was that your first? Yeah. So this I, I call myself a documentary photographer, and there's two iterations in that. Uh, I've got the landscape commission type work, yeah. which which I do, and then I've got the the cruel earth side of things. The Cruel Earth Project, I travelled to Africa in 2006 and I saw these guys mining beside the roadside. Visually, it was fascinating. I'd never seen anything like it. I'd never seen photographs of it, all of that type of stuff. And in 2010, after sort of a few trips to Africa by then, I decided to commence a book on that project. I had no idea how long it was going to take all i knew was it was going to be expensive and it was going to be difficult i didn't even realize that it would be so dangerous to be to be perfectly honest the second iteration was my landscape stuff and up until 2012 or thereabouts i'd always sort of focused largely on taking beautiful photos and and to me after a while that became sort of fairly fairly meaningless so um around 2012 i decided to move away from just taking pictures when the light was good to Picking certain landmarks, people, towns, things that were under uh, in the process of or were going to be subject to to rapid change, and so in the context of my landscape work, I would pick a photograph. It might be the governor near Newman, and I would wait as long as it took for the sun to be the, the basically the light to be right. And on that occasion, it took me seventeen days. And one of the things that I've learned across the journey is that. Um, Initially, I believe that if you put in the work, you were guaranteed an outcome. I've since learnt that putting in the work doesn't guarantee you an outcome, but it optimises the chances. The chances of it, yeah. So, you know, after the the governor, I sort of thought, well, okay, you know, vindication. I've I've put in the work and it's come off again. Um, and then I decided to go and photograph a place called Mount Farquhar in the, the Western Hammersley Range. That was going to be closed off in the coming years because there's big mines going out that way. No one's ever heard of this place. A, a chopper pilot mate, Rossi Rader, who's no longer with us, he's probably sitting up in that pink helicopter who's in the sky. But he was up, he, he said to me, um, he called it the Secret Valley because only the high vis, the mining exploration guys, and the musterers got in there. So I decided to go out there. 2009 had a bit of a crack. I didn't. I got some okay stuff, but in 2013 or 14, 14 it might have been, 13, 14 it might have been that summer. I decided to go back out. I decided to go back out there and and stay there, you know, as long as it took. And I reckon three weeks might be enough to get me my four images. Yeah. As it transpired, the light wasn't happening, the storms weren't happening that year, and I waited five weeks and I got nothing. So I decided to come back the following summer and I thought it'll probably take three weeks and after three weeks, still nothing. So the first sniff I got in that wait across two summers was day 54 and I wasn't even sure that I'd gotten the image then so I decided to stick around longer. Then on day 64, just magic happened and I ended up getting a, a swathe of images. You don't know because I was shooting film and it was like the universe had said, um, here's a reward for, for your patience for, for waiting it out. And then here's a set of steak knives on top. And, and it was just like, um, it was just like the most amazing light across, you know, four or five days. So 
that was vindication. I ended up staying out there till I think it was day 73 or day 77, something like that. So, yeah, it's just and, – and across when you're doing that sort of stuff, one of the ch- one of the challenges is nothing's happening, it's stinking bloody hot, and you're questioning whether it's a good use of your time. That hurry up and wait. The, the hurry up and wait. And, and, and in modern society, there's this sort of – you know, we focus on the quick fix, the yeah. sugar hit, all of that. We need to do things quickly. But we most of the time we fail to project forward and then look back. And when you project forward and look back, the long the slow burn is nearly always the best. And and that's how I sort of try to, to live my life. Couldn't agree more. I was like I think I think it might have even been in one of your videos that I was watching, maybe, but you said comfort doesn't necessarily equal mental well being. Just because we could, you know, easily sit around and, you know, oh, like you said, oh, I'll be able to go out in three weeks. You probably could have tried to just snap some photos in those three weeks and gone, oh, yeah, yeah. but you put in the hard yards, you wait that time out and it's almost like the universe goes, all right, well, here you go then. If you're going to put in that time and effort and project a plan out and have a vision that you want to chase down, then you will, you might not, but like you said, it will increase your chances of actually having that outcome that you're searching for. Correct. It's all about putting in in my game and pretty much I think all, you know, it's putting yourself in that position where um, you give yourself an opportunity. You put yourself in a position so that if an opportunity happens, you've got an opportunity to execute. Yeah. And most people, a lot of people say to me, gee, you've got an exciting life and all of that sort of stuff. The reality is very, very different. And if you think about most professions that people think, are elite or exciting so for example you know it might be um, elite soldiers it might be um, elite footballers elite musicians elite golfers 99.99 percent of their time is spent training Hmm. it's the the excitement component is 0.1 of a percent so if you, for me, if you enjoy the grind, then you're doing pretty well. And in my case, the grind is you do a lot of waiting and I actually like the grind and I reckon I'm doing pretty well. It sounds like you're, you're making leaps and bounds really. If this was like, cause that's what spins me out as well as how you said that photography was never something that you like so you, as, as a kid or whatever, you didn't have photography on the mind. I imagine if you, you know, no, you as, saying- as I said before, I, I'd probably taken about, um, 20 rolls of film in my life. Yeah. So being a professional photographer never really came on into, came onto the radar until, you know, probably I was in my early 30s. And then I went through this sort of internal struggle as to everything I'd ever done, you know, seriously. I'd ended up hating because you just sort of, it was all about practice and all of that and I hated it. But these days I suppose I, I, I've changed a bit and, and I actually enjoy the hard yards. Yep. You know, I enjoy the hard yards, whether that be my music. I enjoy, you know, training for what I'm planning to do over summer. And I I like, you know, I like doing I like doing things that are challenging. If you think about it, in life, the things we remember, they're not that nice dinner. It's not mm. that five-star hotel. It's, it's the struggles. It's like. the struggles. It's usually when things have gone pear-shaped. Yep. You know, or you've had to work really, really hard for something. They're the things that give you the most satisfaction, not staying in a six-star yeah. hotel. We've, we've, I mean, biology drives us to do that in a sense. I always make this argument while we go, why right now are we living in a world where like the poorest people can often be obese? You know, you look at America and you're like, because we're, we're driven biologically to want to hunt and gather and get it. But if you can just drive up to a window and get your food, you get that same dopamine release to go, oh, yep, cool. I've got it. But it's not the same as actually doing the hard yards and going out and collecting your own food or like your training. So this morning you said you've done a 14K hike or or you, the what, yeah, 17 this morning 17 this morning yeah because you're, you're you're training to do another cross uh, what was it great sandy yeah i'm doing a training to cross this uh, great sandy desert in the summer so um yeah and i you know i do that twice a week and and i feel amazing after i've done that you know i feel amazing now one thing that blew my mind as well that i saw in one of your youtube videos and i'll plug all that shit i'll yeah. chuck that up for you because people have to see it um the guys that were diving in Africa for sand, for construction, with like little buckets that they were bringing up to try and sort of uh, get sand out. And it was saying that they could bring like over a ton in a few hour shift with these like shitty little buckets and other dudes that were working in an active volcano mining sulfur 
to bring it up to the surface like that yeah these guys are all um they're all the focus of a project is people that mine for minerals with basically with their bare hands pick, yeah picks and shovels all that type of stuff the guys you mentioned diving for sand were actually in cameroon and they had they went out on these pirogues which are basically large canoes and they position themselves in a in a spot on the river, same position every day pretty much. And then they dive, each of them would fill up one of these pirogues with sand. And in a three and a half hour shift, they were diving with a steel bucket and they were diving anywhere between three and seven metres of water on the low tide generally. They would pull up roughly about 1.7 tonnes of sand and then they take that back to the to the port, and then that get, that would get used in the building construction industry. Those those guys were the the most ripped that I've ever seen. <laughs> yeah. uh, in the volcano, you had guys mining for sulphur basically with their bare hands, and how they got that sulphur. The Ijen volcano is in uh, the on the Indone- on the Indonesian island of Java, and the there's an active volcanic vent comes out in the bottom of the crater. And what they'd done was they put ceramic pipes to tap into that volcanic vent. And the, the, the actual magma chamber was about 20 kilometers below the crater lake. And then the gases came out at 600 degrees or more. And then they would condense in the pipes and run down as liquid. Yeah. And then as they cooled, they would solidify into um, solid sulfur, roughly about 97% pure. And these guys would go in, they'd come three kilometres up the side of the mountain and then drop down a kilometre into the mountain along this precarious track. And the average carry out of the volcano was about 70 kilograms per person. And each of these Indos weighed roughly 55 kilograms. And they would, most of them were doing around about two carries a day. And they were getting paid 6.6 cents um per kilogram carried. So you multiply, you know, 70 times, it's roughly about $4.50 per carry. But they were earning more money doing that than they could have earned in the fields and farms, and that's why they did they it. They do it, yeah. In northern Pakistan, I photographed uh, gem miners. They were mining, some of the highest altitude miners in the world, and they were mining for um, beautiful aquamarine, tourmaline, um, whatever else. And they could only do it three months of the year because of the um, the snows would come during the rest of the season. And they would stay up there at 15,000, 16,000 feet mining for, for those beautiful gems. In Bolivia, they were mining for silver. Um, in West Africa, it was, it was gold in the main. Uh, so, and then in Burma, I, I photographed people, sca- women scavenging for, um, for oil a black, on a black market oil field. And they were going around with rags. And where the oil had been spilt, they would put those rags down in the mud and they'd soak up that oil and squeeze it into a bucket and take it back to their camp and, and filter it. And those women were earning more than the people in the fields and the farms. So the common theme about that project is mm. people, you know, these people are sacrificing the life they could be living now, a much more comfortable life they could be living now for the prospect of a better life because they want a better life for their children, for their wives. They want a better house, possibly even a car. And when you think about that, you think about um, here in... In Perth, even, you know, you've got people slogging it out on a 50-story office building, working 60 hours a week, or you've got cleaners, or you've got FIFO workers, and they're all sacri- they're, none of them enjoy their jobs, but they're sacrificing that life they could be living now because they think that the money they earn gives them the prospect of a better life. Yep. It's so true. And then, so uh, the one that I wanted to lead to, obviously, which was the one that sparked my interest, was Cerro Rico, this crazy mountain they call the mountain that eats men yeah it was called the mountain that you know so colloquially referred to as the mountain that eats men but then there was also they called it the rich mountain because in its day it was had it was basically the richest load of silver in in the world and it bankrolled much of the activities of the and growth of the spanish empire yeah. back in the 16th 16th century because it was like 1545 1545 mining began and and so on that mountain it's estimated that between four and eight million people have died it's insane eh, it's insane when i was there you know between three and five people a, a week were dying on that mountain you know a month i should say were dying on that mountain so 
it was one of the most incredible places I've ever ever been to. The mountain, um, you know, was began four four thousand seven hundred and four thousand eight hundred and thirty two meters, and it it had it shrunk to four thousand seven hundred and ninety two meters, and the mountain was collapsing on itself because it had it had so many voids. I mean, inside Cerro Rico, it was the blackest, darkest place on earth. There was we were a kilometer 500 meters inside the mountain most of the time and and i worked out there were about seven ways you could die you could uh, rock falls falling off ladders um falling down voids people died falling down voids not not long before i got there um de- you know deadly gas explosions um uh, what else were there crashing accidents you know rock falls um it was and then obviously silicosis and i went to the silicosis ward in the potassi hospital and all these guys were on you know basically their lung capacities were down to about 30 or 40 percent and their lungs are trying to work on 30 40 percent capacity at an altitude of 4100 meters you know it's just it was crazy i actually took them in some chocolate because um you know, I figure they they are entitled to a, a bit of a treat, and I smuggled it in. I thought, you know, what damage is it going to do? They're on death row anyway, so yeah, you know, may as well give them a bit of a treat. So yeah, interesting. It's just insane, man. That story in itself is just mind blowing. Eh, the fact that one mountain that in itself is that like an artisanal mine? Are they old school in it? Yeah, in there, there. They're, it's not room and pillar mine with a bloody you know no. augers and shit. It's Tink, 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 tink. Yeah, move, moving inside that mountain, um, you would most of the entrances were probably about probably about four feet high, five feet max. So I'm not a morning person particularly, and and you would you would wake up in the morning. I'd be in the hotel, and you were unsure whether you were going to come out of the mountain that day. But when you got to the entrance to the mountains, the portals, you've got portals all over, um, it was game on and you just had to focus because you had wagons weighing one and a half, two and a half tonnes being pushed by two guys coming straight at you and you had to time your move through the mountain and, you, and you're ducking, you know, this four or five feet high, you're ducking, you've got camera gear and you're trying to move through the mountain without getting crushed and you had to pick, because they had alcoves in there for that you could shelter in as, as the wagons went past. Sort of past. a recess to duck in as the... But then a lot of the time the wagons would meet, you'd have empties coming in and loaders going out, and the empties had to give way to the loaders. So where you would be in the alcove, the next thing these um, wagons empty, weighing probably 200 kilos, the guys would throw them on their sides straight off the rails, and then the, you know, it was deafening in terms of the ears, and then the loader would go past, and then they'd lift it up and off it went, and you'd tuck in behind those loaded wagons because that was the safest way to do it. But if you got your timing wrong, you risk being crushed to death, and that was just, you know, once you got inside the mountain, a lot of the drillers, you know, you had guys working the air leg, which is where a lot of the dust was created, but then you had further inside the mountains where you couldn't get the air legs, you had um, percussion drillers, and that was all hammer hammer and chisel and those guys would drill with a hammer and chisel between two and four 30 centimeter holes per day and but just to get to, into some of those spots was incredibly dangerous a lot of the time you would be crawling on your stomach in probably 12 18 inches of space um, sometimes those gaps weren't sort of flat to the ground they were on a 45 degree slope and there was you know risk of falling and all of that sort of stuff i remember seeing one of the most dangerous things i've ever seen in mining it was a really difficult place to to get to and there were two guys sitting under this pillar and my fixer points up and he was a former miner himself and he looks up at the um they're under this pillar and he points at the edges and the pillar's cracking so at some stage that pillar is going to collapse and it can happen at any moment because the mountain's moving, you're in a, you know, you're in an active earthquake area. And so I sort of shot under that really quickly and came out the other side. And then I was told to be really careful because the rocks I was standing on were the remains of another pillar that had been there. And what had happened was these guys had found a really good load of silver. Some other miners didn't want them to access it. So they blew it up. And that pile of rock that I was standing on could collapse at any stage so 
I'm watching these guys and I'm thinking, hell, if this collapses, what's what's the scenario? What's the situation? Do we get crushed to death or we'll be okay and all of that sort of stuff? So, Are you buried alive inside a mine shaft for however long? Buried uh, inside one of the most one of the darkest areas oh, on the on the planet um you know the other thing about these guys was that they they in the light outside the mine they worshipped god inside the mine they worshipped el teo the devil and each of them would take in at regular intervals they would take in gifts for el teo it might be dynamite it might be tobacco it might be streamers it might be 96% proof alcohol it might be coca and you, often on a Friday they would sit and drink to El Teo and they'd drop a bit of this 96% proof in front of El Teo and then they'd slam the rest down the slot. And that was one of the most interesting, one of, one of the most enjoyable things about working in that mountain was having a drink with El Teo on a Friday afternoon. <laughs> and there were a couple of times, uh, you know, I can recall walking out there absolutely paralytic in, yeah. one, in one of the most dangerous places on the planet. That seems to be a common thread that goes through. I was watching, I don't know if you'd like to go into this uh, Road of Bones sort uh, of area that you that you were talking about in one of your YouTube videos. I was like, I love I loved the fact that they didn't bother to bury the uh, internet cable between Yakutsk and Magadan. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to tell that story. <laughs> yeah, the, the internet cable between Yakutsk and Magadan, the the distance is about 2,025 kilometres and the internet cable basically runs about along the side of the road. You know, what's an internet cable? It's yeah, probably, like a, sort of like a fibre, like this mic sort of thing yeah, almost. Yeah, it's like about a, the same. It's probably, I don't know, that'd be three or four mil. Yeah, yeah. Maybe, maybe more, maybe five or six, yeah. five or six mil cable running between... Um, Yakutsk and Magadan and, and we stopped on the way to Usnira when we were going to Usnira and my, my mate Akadi um, he goes over and picks up this this um, internet cable so that was pretty pretty out there. The Road of Bones is an interesting place. It was built primarily by the Gulag prisoners back in the, I think it was the 30s, 40s and, and 50s and Yakutsk is the, one of the coldest cities in the world um, and Basically, I think around Yakutsk, I can't remember the permafrost depth, but it is what it is. It's, it's a fair bit. It's at least 150 metres or more. And um, Yakutsk is a, an incredible place. And, and um, they, the, the Gulag prisoners built this road of bones and many died in the process of building that road. And because of the permafrost, they couldn't bury them beside the road because of the permafrost. So they buried a lot of these guys in the road formation and in the early years of of that road um, bones would come to the surface periodically during the snow melt or after a rain or whatever else and so that's how it became it's actually called the, the real name is the Colima highway but it actually became referred to as the the road of bones now we did that trip i did a couple of long trips to russia last year and the when we did the road of bones back in um back in january um, temperatures got to minus 58 and, and a few days before we set out on um, doing the road of bones uh, two young guys about 23 and 26 thereabouts they perished when their car broke down they they froze to death and um, one of my team was very concerned about us that the same thing didn't happen to us and of course we we eventually set out we had a lot of car problems but the car broke down actually caught fire and we're on the road of bones it's minus 58 and our car broke down and I learned what happens when your car breaks down in minus 58. The proverbial hits the fan and <laughs> and um, you have to move really, really quick. And, and What do you do in that situation? Well, you, you go straight into your heavy-duty Arctic clothing for a start and then you've got to hope that someone comes yeah. along. And then if someone comes along, which they did in our case, we were lucky about 10 minutes after we, we broke down, it was load everything, load things into the, whatever you can take into their car really quickly. And it's in those situations you've got to be really, really careful because the rush is to get going again. And if you forget something, it might be a glove or your jacket or whatever else, and you break down in that other car, yeah. if you've not got the right clothing, that's when danger really happens. And very often in difficult situations, um, it's the law of cascading stuff-ups. Yep. It's not one thing. It's a it's it's a it's a consolidation of events that usually come together and 
And that's when problems happen. Shit starts rolling downhill and Correct. just gathers more and more as it goes. Correct. You were looking at one stage for, um, was it Russian prospectors? Yeah. Um, I wanted to photograph. And there was a bit of, bit of dodginess almost, it seemed, with your fixer at one stage. Um, yeah, look, I wanted to photograph um, the illegal Russian gold prospectors. And um, it was... It was difficult to find them. That's a, so that's a no-no in Russia, like any yeah. prospecting of any kind is... Yeah, back in, I think it was around about 1954, Stalin outlawed mining for gold other than um, larger companies. For the state, like, but run by companies, you can't do it independently. That's correct. So, but there is a small proportion of people out there that sort of get out there and, and um, you know, prospect and look for gold and there's a push over there to change the laws so it can accommodate you know panning for gold and all of that sort of stuff but yeah it's it's a tricky sort of area and you had because i think you were saying you wanted to go out there for a week but your fixer thought you wanted to go out there for one afternoon or something but then you were like nah yeah we're gonna go out here for a week and you ended up staying with some blokes that didn't you couldn't you couldn't communicate with them they didn't speak english yeah and... um yeah look i just <laughs> You know, culture culture is a really big thing, um, yep. and I think there's in in Russia there's a, a big sense of it's important to save face, and so if things aren't going as people had hoped, then they don't people people don't like to say oh there's we've stuffed up or there's been a something happened. They you know just. And I'm still learning that. Yeah, I love Russia. I love the the Russian people. It's it's an amazing country. I can't can't speak highly enough of the country, and I can't speak highly enough of the people. And the perception that is often created of Russia by the Western media, I, I I've not found that in my travels. I've found Russia to be an incredible place, one of my favourite places on the planet. It really does feel like it's still so ridiculous how there's like this hangover of the Cold War that Russia's the bad guy and the West is the good guy. And it's like they're all just, we're all people just trying to Correct. exist. When you go out to some area and you meet a community, they're not sitting there going, oh, but those goddamn West and blah, blah, blah. It's not like, at all. No, they're, you know, the Russian Russian people in my experience, and I can only speak from my experience, yeah. are in incredibly warm and incredibly generous and i'm i feel very grateful to be able to go there you had a bit of a run-in with a crocodile i believe back in the day in uh yeah that was back in <laughs> that was back in 2007 so that was before you'd even started this whole journey for cruelest earth was it or? correct yeah um it was a yeah it was a it was a second date gone badly wrong <laughs> um a mate of mine, Malcolm Douglas, who's no longer with us, he's yep. probably looking up and still laughing at the what what happened. But um, we went into a place, a really remote part of the Kimberley, and um, anyway, we it was the girl I was seeing at the time. She was a journalist, a television journalist, and she wanted to, or she was going to be moving to Queensland to work over there. So. I thought, well, look, you know, I'll give you, some, I'll show you how to drive. So I let her yep. drive, and as we're driving, she's driving my car in um, to this really remote part of the Kimberley. She's yabbering away, and then not looking where she's going, and she drove into a big hole. Mm. And um, I said, look, that's fine. Just you sit, sit down. I'll get us out. And I went to work on getting us out of here and getting us out of there. And I was just about to turn the um the car when i got it up to the you got, you got the raised up out of the hole and she'd been driving with the spotlights on during the middle of the day and of course she'd flatten the battery Drain the battery yep. when she turned the car off and um so then we were stonkered and i tried everything i could to get life out of the battery yep but the reality was we we're going to have to walk 17 kilometers to get to to get someone to come and pull us out and jump start the battery so I've done quite a lot of survival training and all of that type of stuff. And we start. We waited until 5 o'clock when it was a bit cooler. It was about the, uh, I'm guessing it was around 7th or 8th of August. Yep. And we waited until the sun got lower in the sky. It was about 5 o'clock and we started walking. I took my survival kit, some basics, and she took a, a bag as well. And then it started to get dark and she insisted on using a head torch and up until that point I didn't I preferred to work with my night vision let your eyes adjust and but you know second date she's got a bit of sway 
Yeah. <laughs> and um, anyway, we crossed the Calder River and there's crocodiles potentially up that far, so you've got to be a little bit careful. And about a kilometre after the Calder, I go, whoa, snake. And there was the biggest King Brown I've ever seen in my life. It was straight across the track. It would have been seven foot. It was massive. It was unusual to see them at that time of that time of the year, really, because normally they come out a bit later. Mm. Um, but she panicked and kept walking. And she, her leg must have missed the head of the snake by a matter of inches, two to three inches. So I said, look, just stop. I said, if you don't move, nothing will happen. We won't get bitten. There was cane grass either side. It was pitch black. There was no moon. And I said, can you put the um, your torch on the snake so I can ID the snake? She puts the torch on the snake and I couldn't get a proper look. I said, chuck me the, the torch and I'll ID it. Anyway, she chucks me the torch and nearly decapitates the snake. And this torch pulled up, the head of the torch pulled up three or four centimetres from the head of the snake, st pointing straight at the snake. And it would go off for two minutes at, the, at a time and then it would flicker on for two to three seconds. And this pr pattern was repeated. It was quite bizarre. Anyway, this went on for, I said, look, have you got, your, did you bring your camera? And she brought, and I said, use a flash of your camera, see if we can, you know, get some photos of it. So that didn't work. This went on for 45 minutes where we didn't move at all. And then I had to shuffle in and get this torch out so we could keep moving. And by then, of course, the snake had gone. So somewhere in there, and we couldn't walk around the snake because of cane grass. We didn't know where the snake was, yeah. all of that sort of stuff. So we walked until about 11 at night or 1 a.m. thereabouts. Um, covered quite a few k's. And then the torch died, so we weren't prepared to walk without the torch. And it had been the nights had been pretty mild, but that night I checked when we got back. I checked when we got back to Broome. That night in that area, the temperature got down to one point seven degrees, and we're rough camp. We're rough sleeping, and I got up in the middle of the night and managed to get a fire going because we're on totally charred ground as well, which didn't help. Anyway, we got a, a vehicle out and we pulled ourselves out of that. We got us got pulled out of the um, where we were, and we went on into this remote part of the Kimberley. So the next day we went up this gorge that I'd wanted to take the boat up to. We had Malcolm Douglas's tinny actually. So, yeah. and this is Malcolm Douglas of Outback Legend. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> old, uh, Malcolm. And um, about an hour or so before, we had a great day, about an hour or so before sundown, the, um, I said to the, the, my partner of the time, I said, right, we need to get our skates on. And she was doing some filming of some rock art. And she said, yeah, yeah, it won't be a minute. Anyway, that won't be a minute turned into about 50 minutes. And by then it was... 10 minutes before sundown, we had eight, an eight kilometre gorge to negotiate in a Malcolm's Tinny, which had a lot, which very, very low freeboard. And I was very edgy, very, very edgy. And anyway, I said, right, you get up the front of the boat with a torch and spotlight for crocs and rocks and whatever, you know, any other obstructions. Everything and anything that's going to kill you. Yeah, and it, like we got the boat, the boat in the water and within a few minutes a 10-foot croc went past. He wasn't, didn't even bat an eyelid. And we got to the inlet, which is one of the most dangerous waterways in the Kimberley, and we started hitting these sandbars. And I said, I did, I said to her, I said, look, just stay calm, hold your nerve, everything's going to be all right. And I got within we got I got within a few meters of the bank. I said, "Stay in the water, don't get out. It's too dangerous." And I got her into the bank. She jumped out, pulled some pulled the camera gear out. Fortunately, and um, I said, "You go and get the torch," and because she was very nervous, I said, "You go and get the torch, and I will get the boat in." So she brought the torch to shine things, show where we were, and all of that sort of stuff, and. Anyway, I got 50 metres out and started to bring the, the boat in and a um, uh, mini tidal surge came through and the next thing, I'm the boat's sinking and I'm sitting in water up to my waist, up to my chest, whatever else. And the first thing that goes through your head is this is how people die. 
but you haven't got, you know, you're in the situation, you've just got to deal with it. You know, there's no point going to water. So I started to make for the bank and I thought, should I bring the boat with me? And I thought, no, too dangerous. And um, 10 metres out, I thought, I'm not going to make it because the water and the sky look the same colour. I thought, yeah, I'm, I'm yep. not going to make it. And what's going through my head as I'm doing this is that I know, I know I've been around crocodiles a lot and I know that you know, I was expecting a large crocodile to leap out of the water, grab me by the head and twist it off. Yes. Nah. And I wasn't scared. It just, that's how it happens. 10 metres out, I thought I'm not going to make it. Five metres out, I went straight down a hole. And then <laughs> then I got to the, the bank, still not safe, got up the bank and then we turned around, put the torch on the hull of the boat and there was a, a large crocodile up against the, the hull of the boat. And so it was sort of like, you know, probably you look at that sort of scenario, probably three times in 10, you're going to make the bank seven times in 10, you're not. not, So the the other interesting thing about that was that, um, the night, the night before all of that happened, I was talking in my sleep and, um, my partner said, the RFDS are on standby. The RFDS had said that I'd said the RFDS are on standby, but everything's going to be all right. So that was quite bizarre. Mm, That's a bit Mm. prophetic. Mm. So what's the plan now? You're working on, are you planning on documenting this, uh, cr- like uh, crossing the Great Sandy that you plan that you're in training no, for? No, no. This the, is just a personal? It's a personal thing. Um, I just want to see if I can do it. It's, it's, I know that I can do it this time of year because it's cool. You won't drink much. You don't need much water. I know that I can do it. Yep. I, I want to see that I can do it in summer when it's the country's at its hardest. Yep. I feel that I can, but I've still got to go out there and do the business. So I put a lot of training, a lot of preparation, and I've got good people who've been helping me. Um, but I haven't done the business yet, so I want to go out and and um, and and do that. And th- it's not without risk, not without substantial risk. So how can um, what? Where are you trying to send people? Can people like pre-order your book and the Cruelest Earth Project? That's going to be you're turning that into a coffee table. Yeah, so that's and- that, that's going to be a, a major, you know, photo art book, coffee table book, whatever you want to call it. Yep, it's a big project. That's going to be. A, is that going to be a documentary in itself? And like there, that? there'll be a, a major feature documentary using yep. one or some of the world's best. Uh, adventure cinematographers. Fuck yeah. So at the moment I'm in sort of fundraising mode for that. So yep. if anyone Yep. If anyone plug it, where can people find that shit? <laughs> yeah. So th- basically if people want to learn more about that or donate, they can go to or that they know people that could help drive yep. that forward, they can go to www.cruelestearth.com. So that's C R U E double L E S T earth.com no are you uh, and that's got sort of you know the lowdown on that project i'm also doing i've also got two books i'm working on in australia currently one on the people of Rayburn and then another book on the pilbara and both of those australian books are done a 90 percent done if you want to learn more about my australian work just go to the other website hughbrown.com yep yeah man i can't thank you enough for coming on and telling people you've got some crazy stories it's just so good that i can tell that you're like the demographic of what you're sort of pushing here is exactly what our listeners love they love learning about this unique experience of the human existence or all around from just you know any as any different corner of the world or like I'll, I'll i'll put all your links and that in the show notes so people can find them and i'll tell people to go and look there as well so yeah i mean what's also important to to appreciate is this concept of adventure doesn't need to involve putting your life at risk. Adventure can take many forms. And the, the definition of adventure that I like is this notion that um, the it, it necessarily involves an uncertain outcome. So you can, you can chase adventure in relationships, you can chase adventure in business, or you, you can chase adventure in sport. It's about putting yourself out there. And, and that's you know, fundamentally, it's about putting yourself out there and, and seeing how you measure up. It's that old adage of like, you know, the boat is safest in the harbour, but that's not what boats were built for. They're Correct. meant to go out into the ocean. They're meant to explore. And Correct. We need to get away from this concept that 
the most important thing we can do on this planet is live a long life. It's, yeah. it's not about how long your life is. It's about how... It's what you do in it. It's what you do in it. We, we only get one one go at it that we know of, so yep. um, get out there and make the most of it. Boom. Can't think of a better spot to end it than that, mate. Cheers for coming on. Really no appreciate problems. it. We interrupt our program to bring you this important message.